In the last lesson, we covered the details of infrastructure as a service. In this lesson, I want to show you the basics of how to do an IaaS design. The reason I'm going to do this is because if you are moving from purely on-premises to a cloud solution, and you've been tasked with doing the design, this can seem pretty daunting at first, but it's actually really simple. And I'm going to explain why as we go through this lesson. It's because designing an IaaS solution is just like designing an on-premises solution, which is accessed from a remote office. It uses exactly the same data center design principles. It's just that the data center hardware is in the cloud provider's facility instead of in yours. The hardware components that you're going to use are the same. The way it's all networked together is the same. The way it's accessed is the same. And the way it's secured is also the same. If you remember back from the broad network access lesson, we covered how the network looks like in a traditional on-premise solution when we're accessing our servers in the company data center over on the left here from branch offices over on the right or from teleworkers working from a hotel or from a home, for example. So that's how it looks like. That's how we do the network design for a traditional on-premise solution and how the network looks like for a cloud IaaS solution is this it looks exactly the same. The only difference is that the servers are now in the cloud provider's data center rather than in our data center. So for doing the design, really we do the design just the same way as we've always done it traditionally. So let's have a walkthrough of doing this. And in the example, I'm going to use a pretty standard three-tier e-commerce application. So we've got the web servers at the front end that customers out on the internet are going to connect into. And then traffic goes through to our middleware application server. And then we've got a database server at the back end. So first thing to consider is what are we going to do for compute and storage? And we need to figure out out of those three flavors of IaaS, what are we going to use for the different types of servers? Our front end web servers are going to be pretty low end servers. I don't need a lot of power there. And also I don't have any kind of compliance requirements. So I'm going to go for virtual machines on shared physical servers because that's the most cost effective option. For the middleware application server, let's just say for this example that we've got a compliance requirement where we can't run those servers on shared underlying physical compute infrastructure. So we're going to need to put those on dedicated servers. So for that, I'll choose virtual machines on dedicated physical servers. And then the last one is the database server at the back end. And for this example, we need a powerful server for the database server. We're going to need a high amount of vCPUs, a lot of RAM in there. We also might have more stringent storage requirements as well that aren't available on virtual machines from this particular cloud service provider. So in that case, we're going to put our backend database servers on dedicated bare metal servers. Okay, so that's the compute taken care of. We've made those decisions. The next thing to consider is what are we going to do for the storage? For the front end web server and for the middleware application servers, we're going to have multiple of those servers, but they are all going to have exactly the same content on there. So the same content, we're going to put them into a server farm for both types of the, the two different servers. The easiest option we're going to have for the storage there is to use SAN storage for them. For the backend database server, let's say that for this example, we have got high performance requirements for the storage as well. We need a certain amount of IOPS there. So in that case, we're going to use local disks in that dedicated bare metal server to get the highest possible storage performance. OK, so that's our compute and storage decisions taken care of. The next thing we're going to look at is the networking. So it's quite a lot to consider on this slide here. So with this three tier e-commerce application, traffic is going to come in from external customers over the internet. 
It's then going to hit our front end web servers where the customers will be able to browse our catalog and be able to put things into their shopping cart. From there, the traffic then hits the application server middleware and from there it, it goes to our database servers at the back end. So that's the traffic flow. I'm going to have a firewall in front of my web servers to make sure that traffic can only come in as web traffic on port 80. I'm also going to have a load balancer here as well because I don't just have one web server. I'm going to have more connections coming in than one server can handle. Also, I don't want to have a single point of failure. So I'm going to have multiple web servers. They're all identical copies of each other. They've got the same content and I'm going to put them into a server pool and I'm going to have a load balancer in front of them that's going to balance the incoming connections to the different servers that are in my server farm. I've also got a global load balancer on the outside here as well. I'll talk about what that is there for when we talk about disaster recovery layer. Okay, so I've got my firewall and my load balancer in front of my front end web servers. Then my application servers, I'm going to put those into a different sub network because traffic should never hit the application servers directly from the internet. I'm going to have a firewall in front of them and they're going to be in a different subnet and traffic is only going to be allowed to get to the application server if it's come from the web servers and it's coming through on the correct port number. So I'm doing that to secure them. Again, I don't just have a single application server. I'm going to have multiple servers there to handle the volume of traffic and also because I don't want a single point of failure. So again, I'm going to have a load balancer in front of my application servers to load balance those incoming connections to them. Then at the back end for my database server, again, traffic should not hit the database servers directly from the internet or from the web servers. I'm going to have a firewall in front of them. I put them in a different subnet and on my firewall rules, I allow traffic from the application servers on the correct ports. I don't have a load balancer in front of my database servers because for this example application that is handled within the application itself. I'm going to have at least two database servers because I don't want to have a single point of failure. Other things to talk about here, the server farms can be automatically scaled. With those web servers and the application servers, they're identical. They've got exactly the same content on them. So I can build an image of those ahead of time. Then I can configure a threshold where I say that if the load on my existing servers goes above a certain level, I'm going to automatically spin up an additional server and add it to the server pool. And again, the load balancer will add it to the servers that it's going to be sending the incoming connections to. So this is great. I can automatically scale up and scale down the amount of servers I have in line with the current demand. Okay, with the, the traffic flow we discussed there, that was for traffic coming from external customers to do their shopping. We also need to consider management traffic as well because our own IT engineers are sometimes going to need to get onto those servers to do maintenance. So for incoming management connections, our engineers can either use a VPN, a virtual private network over the internet, or we could set up a direct connection from our office into the cloud provider's facility. Next thing to talk about is backups. So we need to consider these, again, the same way as we would with an on-premise solution. Super importantly, the cloud provider will not automatically back up your data. This is another bit of a misconception or misunderstanding some people have about cloud. They think if they have their servers deployed as a cloud solution, it's in a hardened data center, there's no single points of failure, backups will be automatically taken as well. That is not the case. The service provider is not going to back up your data by default. You need to provision that. The data center is a hardened facility with no single points of failure if you've designed your solution like that, but that doesn't protect your data against regional disasters, the entire data center going down, 
or data corruption. If we look back at the previous slide, you see with my database servers here, I've put two of them in there for redundancy, but if my data gets corrupted, it's gonna get replicated between both of them. It's gonna be corrupted on both servers, so having two servers isn't gonna help me. I need to take backups in case I need to do a restore from a previous version. You have network connectivity to the cloud facility, so one of the ways you could configure your backup is you could back up back to your on-premises office and use your existing backup solution. So you could back up to tape in your office, for example, if you wanted to. You can also back up to the cloud provider storage. If you are gonna back up your data to the cloud provider storage, make sure you're backing up to a different data center than where your servers are located. Again, we might have that regional disaster. If we lose the entire data center, it's not gonna help us much if our backups are also in the same data center. Data should always be backed up to an offsite location. Next thing to talk about is disaster recovery. If the data center is lost, you'll be able to recover to a different location, to a different data center from those backups as long as they were stored off-site. In that case, you'll lose all new data since the last backup was taken. So we're talking about RPO here, the recovery point objective. What RPO means is in the worst case scenario, how much data could you lose if you have to restore to a different location? So for example, if you're taking backups every night, your RPO would be 24 hours because worst case scenario would be you have the disaster just before you take the next backup. So all of the new data that was written today since the last backup is going to be lost. Uh, best case scenario would be that the disaster occurs just after we'd taken the backup. But when we talk about RPO, it's the worst case scenario we talk about. So if you're, if you're recovering for backups and you take a backup every day, your RPO would be 24 hours. It could take a significant amount of time to deploy the infrastructure in the new location and restore the data as well. So just like we've got the RPO, the recovery point objective, we need to consider the recovery time objective as well. Using our same example again, let's say we're gonna just restore from backup, so our RPO is 24 hours. But when we do fail over to the new location, it's not like bang, we can just click our fingers and everything's gonna be back up and running. We're gonna to have to do the restore, which is gonna take time. We're also gonna to have to deploy our new servers. We're also gonna to need to configure our firewall rules, configure our load balancing, etc. That's all gonna take time. So the RTO is gonna be how long it takes to get back up and running again. It's not as easy to calculate this like it is with RPO. The RTO, really to calculate this, you need to do a test recovery. So do a test failover to the new site and see how long it takes you to get back up and running again. Okay, so if we are just restoring from backups, you can see there that the RPO and the RTO is gonna be quite long and that might not be acceptable. You may want to provision a disaster recovery solution to reduce the RPO and RTO. So that's what we're doing here. You can see over on the left, this is the same cloud solution that we deployed already. So this is the main site here. Customers are gonna be coming in over the internet and we're gonna be hitting our three tier application in the main cloud data center on the left. But we want to have a fast disaster recovery solution available as well. So what we're gonna do for that is in a different data center, we are going to provision web server, application server, and database server, and configure our load balancer and firewall rules as well. So we're gonna have infrastructure already set up ahead of time, so if we do have to fail over, this is gonna give us a fast RTO because we're, gonna, we're ready to fail over when we need to. We are also gonna need the data to be available in that disaster recovery site as well, so we're gonna need to replicate the data from the database servers on the left, in the main site, to the database server in the DR site. I don't need to replicate my web servers and application servers in this example because they are just using static content so I can deploy these from images. The last thing to mention here is my global load balancers. 
they're there to direct incoming connections to the correct data center. So in normal operations, incoming connections will get directed to the main site. If the main site goes down, I will fail over to the DR site and my global load balancer will direct new incoming connections there. You only need the global load balancer if you've got a disaster recovery solution. If we only had our service running in one site, we wouldn't need that component. Now, obviously, if you're going for this kind of disaster recovery solution rather than just backups, it's going to be more expensive because you do need to deploy additional infrastructure in the disaster recovery site. But this is going to give you reduced RPO and RTO. We're typically not going to deploy exactly the same infrastructure in the disaster recovery site as in the main site because this is just a backup site. We'll just put minimal infrastructure in there to give us the most cost effective way of doing this. Thanks very much for watching. If you found this video useful, then you can click the link above my head now to get access to my complete introduction to Cloud Course. That's all for free. And also please subscribe so that you can get my latest tutorials.